Hello. Welcome, welcome. Find a seat. Thank you so much for coming out this afternoon. Such an honor to be here with this incredible audience full of our community. Um, my name is Lucasa Bramfman Verissimo, and I am a programmer through the Art Lab space, which is just behind this, all of the seating downstairs. Um, and it's an open art making space for visitors of the museum, so come join us. We have monthly programming events that happen through that space, as well as open drop-in art time hours. Um, and I am so, so honored to have this event happen here at the museum and to introduce this incredible program, Visiting Lou. I'm just saying that it's Lou Day every day, but especially today. Um, can I just get a show of hands for folks who, this is their first time coming to the museum? Is anyone? Oh my gosh, yeah! <laughs> welcome, welcome. We hope that you come back. Um, so, yes. I'm gonna start off by introducing Samantha Espinoza Sochil, Mar Samantha Maria Sochil Espinoza is a Chicana teacher and creator living in Oakland, California. She grew up in LA and Denver, Colorado, and loves being a Libra. She references living in between worlds, homes, and identities as a marker of her Chicana identity. Her work is created out of historical and personal traumas that introduce wider conversations on racialized, gendered, sexual, and capitalist oppressions. Her work is meant as gift to fellow brown women in the hopes that they will see their stories reflected or whispered within her work. She creates from a background rooted in organizing generational pains and memory and falling in love frequently. Samantha. Thank you so much. Um, if you don't mind, I'll begin reading now. Um, this is an excerpt from July 1976 to January 1977. Yesterday was the annual Gay Pride Parade and it was spectacular. The papers estimate 120,000 watching and participating. I didn't march, maybe would have had I felt in a cheerier mood, but it didn't take long for me to get all choked up by it. And when the gay fathers group contingent went by and a young man holding a little kid like Jakey on his shoulders and the kid holding a sign saying, I'm proud of my gay dad, I just couldn't hold back the tears any longer. I felt so deeply that they are my people, though I know I can never be accepted as one of them. Sunday night slept over at Jay's. Monday had off work, but he didn't. I took a nice bath, washed my hair, dressed in all black, and wore my binder for the first time in a long time. Black pants, black t-shirt, and black long sleeve cotton shirt, tucked in but open. Silver pens in pocket, silver ID bracelet, silver sunglasses. Went downtown and some guy comes up to me and says he's a photographer and gives me his card, compiling a book on people in SF and he thinks I'd make an interesting addition to his photos, and would I sit for him, and he'd give me copies of the picture he took. I said, okay, and we took the bus to his place. He was close to my age, very clean cut, looked intellectual. We barely spoke to each other. His place was very close to empty, but for his backdrops, camera, some other of his photos tacked on the wall. I hardly even combed my hair. He stood me there, arranged the lighting, and took about 36 pictures. I hardly moved. He never told me what to do except just turn your head slightly this way kind of stuff. I just shifted, gave my usual dirty looks. Remember I used to call them Bobby Dylan looks and punk postures. When he finished, I got the distinct impression of those people they say have sex with you and then want you out of their sight immediately. He almost rushed me out. I said I'd get in touch with him. Went back, downtown, went back downtown feelings 100 feet tall and so punky. Out of sight, I'd been discovered. So much wanted to tell, so much and I wanted to tell someone. Knew Jay's reaction would be of one of jealousy and why couldn't it have been him instead of happy for me? My motto, since I decided we had to get separate places, has been let go. 
Not let go of Jay, but just let go. Sat aft, went to see David Bowie's movie. Came out of there envisioning how beautiful he is and how I could look just like him if only I'd more thought of mastectomy. That word sounds like a species of dinosaur and sterilization. There's a TVTS drop-in rap group in Berkeley at a reputed center every first and third Wednesday of the month. I should go and talk this out, get it settled in my mind once and for all, one way or the other. Wandered to that certain bar David thought I'd like. It's funny how it happens, but I'm standing there, casually surveying the crowd, really not out for anything, and then my eyes fall on this gorgeous thing, and I'm starstruck. Him. I sidled up to him, asked if I can buy him a drink. He says, oh, I just love a Coca-Cola. Oh my God, he's a real live doll. So incredibly thin and graceful and tall and giddy, his face is perfect, Rudolf Nureyev, when he was beautiful. We danced sexy a little, I got him another soda, I can't believe how slender his hips are, and oh dear God, he has slim hips that could go into a small bottle. <laughs> he is smiling, laughing, gyrating to the music. He kissed me, and I proceeded to continue kissing his perfect neck, his bare neck, his bare chest, at his partially open shirt. He was fragrant with perfume and makeup, and he was smiling, still and quiet. His eyes closed as I kissed and tasted him. Oh God, pleasure I hadn't felt since, dare I say, that fart M. It was near bar closing time, and he went off to make the rounds one more time. I saw him circle past once and wink at me, and then he disappeared. Ah, sweet moments, another vanishing angel in the night. Such a sentimental fool, I figure I got my buck's worth of kisses off his neck. On the street, we ran into some guy who used to work next door to Jay's work. Jay introduced me to him as Lou, and we shook hands. And then this guy leans his arm on my shoulder and says, hey man, no offense or anything, but the first time I saw you come in to Jay's work, I thought you were a girl in a tuxedo. Tuxedo? But I said, oh no, like how could you possibly have thought of that? And Jay just smiled. That does it. I had been going back to introducing myself as Shyla, not using Lou anymore, and I'm causing as much controversy trying to be Shyla as I feel I am trying to be Lou. Told Jay I was going to a doctor at this TVTS group to get this question straight in my mind, and he was obviously against it. Even said I was wasting my time hanging around with all of those but stopping short of whatever he was going to call us. Yesterday, I phoned the psychologist I'd seen when going, cra when going crazy trying to find a job at the Center for Special Problems. Told her I thought I was ready for their TS group. She asked me to call the group coordinator tomorrow and she'll tell her to expect my call. So I phoned her today. She warned me the group was all male to female, if that bothered me. Told her they're the only kind I've had contact with so far. We made an appointment to meet and talk next Monday. I really hope it helps to go through this doctor bit. I'm so weary of considering it. I just want a mastectomy and to get sterilized and continue living this half and half life. I don't feel this surgery would make me a better man or woman, but I know it would make me a better person. I don't believe I can successfully live as a man or as a woman. But I have to do all I can to live comfortably and the surgery would do that. I have never felt as sure of that as I do now. It's really difficult for me to write down what's been going on, my feelings, etc. The two weeks between when I first talked to Claire Kapoor, the counselor for transsexuals, and our first session were ridden with hectic downs and euphoric ups. My thoughts were so laden with this switching over idea I could barely function at work. I tried unceasingly to step outside of myself, see myself as others would, trying to imagine what I'd be like as a male, how I would pass, how I'd be different, how I'd be different, could I really make it, what about my job, J, et cetera, et cetera. And then, like an angel sent just for me, Saturday morning's paper on the front page, just for me. I knew immediately that I had to talk with her and she could set me on the right path, just the thought that there was someone else like me. I told J I would write her to meet with her and we had our first real discussion. The two things he said that stuck in my mind were, what are we going to be afterwards? Friends? I'm basically straight, you know. And 
I'm going to use as much of my influence to stop you from doing it as other people are influencing you to do it. And that, in essence, if I do go through with the change, I will have seen the last of him. He said that. I felt pretty bad. Later that night, we had a second similar talk. He said my ambiguity was one of the few things that made me interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Afterwards, I cried while talking with Charles about it, saying I don't want to be interesting. I want to be happy. Next, I'm going to introduce Mason J. Um, and Samantha and Mason have work that's featured in a limited edition newsletter that we made for this event which is on this table behind us. So after the panel is over, please go and grab one. There's some magical, special Lou Sullivan horoscopes and other fun things in there. Mason J is a genderqueer, femme of color, SF-born historian, community organizer, and artist. Their musings on queer trans issues appear in SF Weekly, The Bay Area Reporter, The Chronicle, LA Times, Huff Post, Dude, Original Plumbing, Archer Mirage, Three, Periodical, Many Zines, and All Over the Internet. When they are not creating, they're likely watching ballroom kiki scene videos on YouTube, reading in a park, or serving as the inaugural fellow of the SF Public Library's James C. Hormel LGBTQIA archive. Mason. Thanks, I'm really honored to be a part of this. I have a bit of imposter syndrome when it comes to stuff around Lou. Um, uh, but I really was just taken aback by this book and really inspired in my own writing to continue along the path I've been working on, del delving into more things around trans masculine identity, a genderqueer identity, what it means to be a non-binary femme who's also on T and male passing. Um, and yeah, like at first I was like really giddy about this book and I still am. I think I'll always be giddy about this book so I really want to thank Ellis and Zach for um, compiling it. And <laughs> I think this is a really beautiful gift to not only our community but those who know nothing about our community and now will. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna do something a little different. I'm gonna read the pieces that I wrote that were inspired by a few short sections of the book and then kind of talk about a little of what went into those. So the first one I have is actually on page 30, and it is, some night I'm gonna dress like a boy and walk down some cool streets being thought of as a boy. And the poem that goes with that. Um, yeah, you could hold it for me. That'd be really helpful because I am a millennial and I am about to pull my phone out of my pocket to read from it. Um, but I started thinking about like what, what it means to, to actually have that be my reality, to dress up real cool at my leisure and to put on whatever costume, whatever form of maleness, whatever form of femme I, I choose and to, and to leave the house in that. And so I thought of that kind of, that kind of line as an actual prayer, as like something into the future. And this is kind of my response to that, which is kind of like the holy song of Lou's prayer to be that boy who walks amongst the street. Here's to building communities around the mission at bus stops, corner stores, in writing groups, tiptoeing through queer archives and pissy public restrooms in the tenderloin, cruising south of market in leather jackets, jock straps, Carhartt skull caps, a toast for trans twinks and baby gays prancing around the Castro, popping prep like Pez while cruising for validation in skin-tight jeans. Pre-folded hankies in their back pockets. Hooray for Polk Gulch rent boys with sleepy eyes, toothpick legs, and thick wallets. Hate street hippies laid on couches with loose joints atop bar stools or asleep in soft, messy beds. Fitted with jizz-stained sheets and the ghosts of who we all used to be. Precious are the not-so-tender queers, trade illusionists, banshee boys, tiny tops, wolves, pigs, bears. The blouses, the bookish boys, fairies, art queens, unrepentant trans fags, gender-shy grad students, and cranky trampas. 
the FTMs, the thems, the non-woman femmes holding space in cafes, pool halls, locker rooms, personal ads, or anywhere where the flames of hook hookup culture burn. For the no and low hormone hoes with hungry holes, tall, limp-wristed syringe slingers, short, stocky boys with tattoos on their skin grafts, and queer core cuties with faded huggy bear t-shirts. For the popper stained noses, every bruised kneed boy with a bald head and hairy ass. Sacred are the trans fat and sissified past, present, and future. Blessed be every trans fag treasure for showing relentless love to ourselves and any other homo lucky enough to know or love us. And then this next one is from page 281, and it's, it's not how others perceive me that matters, it's how I perceive myself. And where is it? Here. And I thought about the way I perceive myself. I don't actually perceive myself as a man, woman, or hybrid of the two, or anything. I perceive myself as kind of like a natural being, like constantly in a growth process or in a germination process. So I started thinking about like, what that looked like, and I started looking at botany books and looking up definitions for things, and I stumbled across the dictionary definition of radical, um, which has double meanings and is really beautiful. And so I started working with this idea of trans bodies as weeds in a yard, kind of only growing for one another. Um, and so this is called weeds in the yard. Radical, noun, botany. The first par part of a plant embryo to emerge from a seedling during germination. Anatomy, a root-like subdivision of a nerve or vein. Radical, adjective, of change or action, relating to or affecting a subject's fundamental nature, far-reaching and methodical, advocating rigorous political or social change, endorsing a progressive section of a political party or extremist ideology. They blossom in the gardens, and with composted girlhoods toil in the female soil they are no longer loyal to, budlets springing to, to bloom, and leaves of sweet grass sprouting on their chins, trails of baby's breath lining bulb-shaped bellies, their unified roots unearth a radical love. Between petunia punks and snapdragon sissies, daffodil dudes, as the rhizomes of gender begin to decompose. Climbing into the warmth, they swap lemon balm kisses, sip chamomile for sleeplessness, snack on honeycomb chests and baby carrot cocks. Syrupy hands and candied necks will chlorophyll cocktails before tucking themselves into tea for tea flower beds. And then this last one appears on page 330. And as someone who works in an archive, it just was really what made the book for me. Like, I, I don't even know how to talk about it. Like, I had a really, really intense emotional experience reading this book, and I'm sure everyone else did. It was wrought with a lot of things, because I am kind of of the school that um, I love my idols, but I also am not open to crit critiquing my idols. So it got me thinking about what it means to look at the archives when not necessarily has much changed in terms of how people relate to themselves and their genders, but the language has changed for it and the feelings and the kind of expectations about how we, we relate to it change. I remember when I came out, unlike Lou, I wasn't worried about being fruity. I was like really excited to be fruity. That was like the most exciting thing to be about my transition. And so I started thinking about what it means to kind of have these bodies and what it means to look in the future. And I started to think of Lou as an oracle and not just an oracle who saw all good, but also the bad and the predictions for the femphobia, the internalized transphobia, that all of us like, navigate, whether consciously or unconsciously. And so that's what kind of came out of this, this idea that Lou was this oracle giving us a message from the future. And this is called On Divinations and Archives. There are archives in transmasculine bodies, and with it, each gender obscuration hides an invocation to share with the world. Assembled beside nostalgia, patience, and hormones, the humble soothsayer sits, bearing witness and communing with deities, scribbling incantations amid the tomes of his diary. He writes spellbooks disguised as medicinal vapors in our bloodlines to remind us we are not the vessels we were born into. Seeing far into the future, using the powers of prediction, he acts as the oracle and constructs altars with two cauldron-shaped scars and two silicone orbs to protect him. In gratitude, his disciples offer needles, binders, and mustache clippings, 
modest talismans for the rights of the transition order. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm now gonna introduce Isaac, Zach, and Ellis, who are going to be in conversation um, before we all invite you to purchase a book upstairs in the store and grab a newsletter. Isaac Fellman is the reference archivist at the GLBT Historical Society where he connects the public with the society's astonishing collection of queer manuscripts, diaries, artifacts, phot photographs, buttons, matchbooks, t-shirts, drag gear, and pornography. He is also the Lambda-winning author of a fantasy novel, The Breath of the Sun. Isaac is now working on the Trans for Trans road trip novel that he's realized nobody is going to write for him. Ellis Martin works with digital derivative, derivative sorry, <laughs> in, the inter in the interstice of art and archive. Martin holds a BA in visual and critical studies from Mills College. He has generated large-scale digital digitalization projects at the Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, and Transgender Historical Society, John J. Wilcox, Junior Archives and Mill College, Mills College Art Museum, and is currently working at Oakland Museum of California with the Dorothea Langs Collection. His short films have screened at San Francisco Transgender Film Festival and Transstellar Film Festival. And Zach Ozma is a poet, potter, and social practice artist, embodiment theory, archival research, and neoclassical gay imagery inform his practice. Employing mimesis, pedagogy, humor, surprise, and reward, he works in a variety of materials, including ceramics, found objects, performance, writing, and works on paper. He is the author of Black Dog Drinking from an Outdoor Pool, Sibling Rivalry Press, 2019. He holds a BFA in Community Arts from California College of the Arts in Oakland. Ozma lives and works in Philadelphia area. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, thank you guys all so much for coming. Um, yeah, I'm, this is beautiful. Word. <laughs> um, I am absolutely delighted to be here. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to converse with you upon this occasion. Um, I'm going to be millennial too and get my phone out because all my notes are on it as well. Um, the first thing that I wanted to talk about is um, sort of the experience of opening these diaries in person because an archival experience is so different from the experience of reading a secondary source. It's very sensory, it's very immediate, and the diaries are, they're really remarkable objects in and of themselves. Uh, can you speak to that a little bit, both of you? Sure. Um, I first um, looked at the diaries when they were on a long-term loan to the SF Public Library, so I would like go get out of Civic Center BART, have the like experience of taking the elevator up to the sixth floor, um, and then once you sign in, the archivist had to go get the box from the collection. So there was this like the first time I went, there was this like very nervous waiting moment, like wait, like waiting for your blind date kind of thing, and um, I hadn't really spent any significant time in archives before that. Um, and the experience of opening up the diaries, which I, you know, had heard a few of the sort of like favorite lines from that get repeated, but hadn't read in any substantial way because you used to not be able to do that before right now. Um, 
seeing the progression of his handwriting through his life is really incredible, especially in the very first diary. There's like um, a, cr- a orange crayon scribbled out page um, very close to the beginning. So things like that um, that are so intimate and the kind of thing that like my own scribbled pages from when I was 10 years old are probably not something that I kept. Um, and seeing the diaries in their original form where they have a smell and where some of the spines are broken and some of them have locks, um, which are unlocked, fortunately, for us. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Um, but also where there's, um, you know, like, newspaper, like, crumbly old newspaper clippings of Paul McCartney's face taped in with, like, ancient yellow shiny cello tape. Um, is a very different and really kind of like spiritual level intimate experience with somebody's writing. Yeah. Yeah, I think just just to add to kind of your list of things that we kind of discovered within the diaries, um, there were a few moments where we would be sitting next to each other at the in the history center and we would find a hair in the diaries. We'd mm-hmm. kind of, you know, well, at first it would be like, well, do we touch it? Like, is it loose hair? Are we allowed to touch this? Are we allowed to touch the pages? So I guess we can touch this hair, but... <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, is it the hair of, like, some other researcher, which is also an interesting catalog in its own way? Right, right, right. Yeah. So... I have, for whatever reason, a huge amount of hair at the GLBT Historical Society, <laughs> both from the head and from other, you know, zones. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it's, uh, there was a scholar named uh, Marika Sifor who wrote a piece about, yeah, about uh, hair in archives specifically and how it's both dead and alive at the same time. It's the presence and the absence of a body at the same time, which is, that really says a lot about Lou to me as well. Mm-hmm. So, um, I wanted to ask you about um, how you found your path through these diaries because I, I remember I asked you at the pre-meeting about this, what percentage of the diaries is in this book? And you said, oh God, but then sort of settled on maybe a quarter. So it's not a huge amount. Um, how, did you, how did you cut down this sculpture out of the block of clay that Lou gave us? Um, well, I guess we thought about it after you left and it's probably less than a quarter. So just, to, to, it's a tiny amount. It's, it's a tiny amount. There's so much text yeah, yeah. Um, in the diaries. But I think, um, you know, the, the way that Zach thinks and the way that I think, we have our working styles um, and also just our process fits really nicely together. And so, you know, Zach is able to hold the, uh, all of these teeny tiny details and moments within the book and actual experiential pieces of Lou's life at the same time and think about it as a narrative structure. And then I'm, I work more in like a architectural structure and so you know all of the management of the data and also you know just being able to see um, picking within time periods and trying to you know balance the book in that way um, that simultaneously you know we not clipping the narrative but also making sure that we were being relatively consistent um, I think that's it's the two of us, I think that's how we did it. And to add a little bit more of what that process actually looked like, um, we started with the original Catholic school cursive handwritten diaries um, that hadn't been transcribed or scanned. Ellis photographed every page of every diary and put those into PDFs. And then um, in order to not transcribe the entire thing and spend like 16 years doing this project, we, um, see it, see it. we made our approximate selections, sort of like an outline of what the book might be in an incredibly complex, beautiful spreadsheet. Um, so for a long time we were reading through and saying like, yeah, we know we need to put that in. If we put that in, we probably need this next part that explained what happened next. Um, and so we had this structure and then when we went back to begin transcribing, we again culled those entries down and said, okay, he has, um, he has a fight with his boyfriend, Jay, who Samantha was reading about. And then he has that same fight. 30, 40 more times and documents all of them. Maybe we just need to put it in two times to show that it was a pattern. And we talked a lot about having, um, 
It's it really is like yeah. the same so the same times. fight over and over and over, <laughs> which I think that a lot of us sort of know and and can uh, use our personal experience to fill that in. And a lot of the times we talked about having smart readers who could make some leaps um, so that we didn't have to put absolutely everything in the text. It just takes a second. Yeah. Got it. Um, it, it is an interesting thing about uh, reading the diaries, and I'm relatively new at GLBTHS, so I haven't read substantially more of them than is in the book. Um, I, I will say that the repetition of it is always striking to me, and the fact that, um, I don't know, like I don't think that Lou's life was unique for that. I think that all lives are kind of cyclical, um, but it's the kind of thing that you rarely see reflected in a project, because you usually don't see a literary project of this sheer breadth. Um, okay, uh, let's see, I was going to ask about, we kind of answered that one already. Um, we, t we talked about uh, finding the rhythm of the diaries and in the repetition of fights, in the repetition of interests and obsessions and anxieties. Um, I wanted to ask about also um, the diary as uh, in many ways a form of transition, um, especially before Lou uh, medically or largely socially transitioned. Uh, the idea kept striking me as I read the book that the diary is a um, a way of inscribing the body with meaning. Um, when I read Jordi Ro Rosenberg's uh, Confessions of the Fox recently, he talks about that a lot, um, very archival, transmasculine novel. Um, can we talk about how Luz sort of wrote his masculinity into being in these diaries? Um, Lou used the language of fantasy a, a lot which is, is somewhat like slippery, sticky language um, to try to talk about in terms of like trans embodiment because it's really easy when you begin using the language of fantasy to say, to make it sound like this thing that he was articulating was false. Um, but I think that he used fantasy a little bit as a, a future looking tool to imagine a life that he not only wanted but felt in some ways already a part of before he was, which I think specifically was the life of a gay man in community with other gay men. Um, and so through um, celebrity obsessions and sort of like, you know, imagining himself making his, his Bobby Dylan faces or um, through his 10 year relationship um, with his boyfriend Jay, he spends a lot of time like dressing Jay up in beautiful flowing outfits that Lou didn't feel like would have looked right on him and then saying like what while we were having sex I imagined that I was Jay and recording all of that in the diary so um it's a I think that the diaries were a space that he got to play um in that realm a lot before it was physically happening in his life and I think something that kind of keeps it away from that point the slippery point that you mentioned earlier that you touched on is the fact that he was re he was simultaneously re recording his experiences, you know, in kind of reflection, often in the evenings or you know, talking about the night before, and that cemented kind of specific. This is what the space smelled like. This is who I saw. This is what they looked like. This is what I wore. All of those like very specific details, then combined with this sort of future-looking projection of where h himself into a gay man's space feels feels like th that was the way that you know, it, we were able to balance that and, and keep it away from fantasy as false. It goes back to what you were saying about um, Lou being an, an oracle of sorts, um, personal future and uh, in many ways the, uh, I don't, I don't know, I don't think that it would be too strong a statement to say that the future of transmasculinity was something that he predicted and figured out. Um, certainly, like, he was more responsible, I think, than he gets credit for, for uh, formulating what transmasculine community looks like. Um, and I think specifically for uh, articulating, like, a desirability there, um, both, like, among trans men, for ourselves and also in like the larger gay community beginning to carve out a space of like an additional variety of gay man. That, that's a beautiful way of putting it, yeah, thank you.
Um, I, I guess this leads uh, pretty nicely into another thing that I have been thinking about with regard to this book. Um, I wanted to talk from the beginning about the ways that we love Lou, my notes say, and the ways that he disappoints us, and Lou <laughs> as our friend. Um, I think that this book is it's very anti-hagiographic, and um, just by nature of being the, the mediated but actual and direct words. Um, can we talk about what it means to have a hero versus what it means to simply look up to someone and see them as a friend, in a way? Yeah, I think w one thing that w was really helpful for us while um, shaping the book um, is that, I mean, we talked a lot about if we identified with Lou and, and how, and, and cancer was pretty much no, you know, there's, in, in terms of like specifically Lou himself and kind of the, pr you know, projection that you can do that takes someone from uh, identifying with to a sort of an idol level. And so I think, um, you know, having that little bit of distance was really helpful for us in choosing what to maintain and, and what to, to, and to what to let go. Um, and I think part of, you know, our, our larger goal was to cement Lou in his socio-political economic, you know, his, his standing and to show the world in which he lived and the world and he created. And um, so I think, you know, it was kind of stri striking a balance. Um, to, to make sure that the book was welcoming, but also to acknowledge that Lou was problematic and Lou, you know, definitely had misogyny and racism and fatphobia. Fat phobia. Yeah, totally. And so, um, you know, to, to not make that disappear b because, you know, it, that is part of who he was. Um, and so to acknowledge that. And I also, I think that before I started working with the archive myself, um, the version of Lou that was sort of like on Wikipedia and like, you know, occasionally would pop up on like a trans history thing um, was very much flattened. And the story of Lou Sullivan was, Lou Sullivan was the martyr who put his body on the line so that trans men could medically transition through sanctioned channels. So boring. Which is, I don't necessarily think it's boring, and I, and I think I think it's somewhat true. And there's like a whole larger story here that we could talk about forever. Um, Susan Stryker has a really marvelous essay about how he kind of falls into the the changing landscape um, of trans medicine. Um, but a really important project of this book was to present Lou as an individual instead of as a kind of martyr figure, um, and as someone who is like makes embarrassing mistakes sometimes and like presents stuff in an embarrassing way sometimes. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's a really important part of the project as well. Um, I remember um, th thinking about Lou's evolving consciousness and the ways that, <laughs> and his problematicness. Um, there's a scene where he's meeting Steve Dane for the first time who, um, like was a, a senior trans guy to him. Was he the first trans guy he ever met? I want to say that that's true. I think that he was the first trans guy he met who had medically transitioned. Oh, oh yeah, you're right. That's an important distinction. Um, and uh, he's, he's misgendering Dane in the diary. He's saying like, I, I, I talked to her and she seemed so amazing and, and et cetera, et cetera. And then he clarifies, like, I like to call him her because it helps me understand that we're the same person and that he started from, from where I am. And uh, I'm sitting there, you know, like cringing a little bit because I'm, and he does the same thing with Jack B. Garland. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it, but at the same time, like I, I get it. I totally get why he's doing this and how he's developing new ways of thinking. And he evolves a lot in the course of this story as well. And in many ways was developing that language in some isolation. Yeah without yes. anyone to say like, actually that's kind of like a, a cringy move for you to do that. He was like thinking through all of it alone with his diary. Yeah. Yeah, if, if he had been, I mean, this, this really would be a hagiography if, if Lou Sullivan had been born woke, um, <laughs> but, but he was not and uh, we all benefit from this. Woke assigned at birth. Yo, oh my God, <laughs> AWAB. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it is, uh, it's part of the reason that the book is, um, hmm, 
both beautiful and anxiety producing though as well that he is alone throughout it and you feel his aloneness almost until like the end until the last few years of his life when he finally had lots of transmasculine people around him um it can feel like a, a locked chamber sometimes um oh uh let's see do, do you want to talk about the design of the book or um yeah, let's go. We want to bring some friends to talk about yeah. the design of the book, though. Yeah, yeah um, bring the friends on. Yeah. So this book came to be in a kind of complicated way, which I won't bore you with a lot. But two publishers worked on this. And the initial publisher who we worked with, Timeless Infinite Light, who now has um, evolved into some other different forms of being other than a book publisher, um, they did so much for this text. Um, the initial visioning, the developmental editing, and the design of the book, which we all love, but the Instagram algorithm hates. Um, sexually explicit. Um, so I'm going to read the little timeless bio, and then um, you want to, oh no, you should read it. You should read it. And then can we, can we switch out chairs? Okay, I'll get the other ones. Timeless Infinite Light, legitimizing sacred pornography recrystallized by common insights into wealth and anxiety, the knowledge of the future kneels into lavender. How will you be able to bear it in us by? And hi. Hi, hi y'all. Thanks hi. for joining hi. us. Hello. <laughs> um, do you want to start? Um, yeah. Oh, oh, oh mm -hmm. I remember. Yeah. We took we took notes before, and I took a photo of them with my brain. <laughs> um, <laughs> I got a photo on my phone. Too. Um, my first question is for um, M G Saint Sparrow. Um, on the end here, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit since you were really there for the very first like nugget of an idea, initial visioning of the book. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that vision um, started and how it affected um, the like really serious choices you made in the developmental editing process that like helped make the final structure. Well, when a lot. the book first began, it was, I believe, you being obsessed with being in the archives while working on your undergrad thesis art show. And we were friends and hanging out a lot. And at some point you were talking about how it was so horrible that there wasn't, that it wasn't published, that other people couldn't read it, <laughs> that it just, it was just such a magical text, and it just needed to be in the world. And I was like, mm, you, know, you know I'm a publisher, <laughs> right? <laughs> and at this point, you know that you're probably one of the few people in this world that has the most expertise and inter intimate knowledge of these journals because of your being obsessed with them. <laughs> and because Guilty. they're just, and because there's so many of them, and because they're so just in the basement of an archive, which is m where most archives are. Yeah. But um, yeah, and I think, I think I was just like, kind of just taking this conversation and being like, oh yeah, that would be really cool, wouldn't it? Um, and, Oh my God, wouldn't that be, and? <laughs> um, and so, so I think one of my roles as developmental editor, unfortunately, is being the person that says um, no all the time, which is not really an exciting role to be in, but um, it's being like, oh my God, you're so excited. And what if we don't do that? <laughs> <laughs> Which is just basically, I think, back to what Ellis was saying about creating a developmental, like, or creating a narrative arc, which Lauren was incredibly valuable in helping to construct. And also having to just choose to not participate for a section from the inception of the work to this really intense 
kind of nonstop period at the end when we are taking a over 600 page long book and, so long. and then me telling you to cut ha it in half. <laughs> <laughs> which we didn't completely end up doing, but that was because we changed the type design. <laughs> of course, yeah, no, um, I've just been told to jump in if I have specific design questions, and I totally do. Um, <laughs> I really want to, um, I keep saying I want to talk, I'm very keen on talking, it's just a tick I have. Um, the design of the book and how it echoes the experience of looking at the diaries, uh, not directly and explicitly, but through metaphor. Like, for example, um, I really noticed when I first saw the design of this book, it's not especially retro, it's very current, it's kind of futuristic, it doesn't say, I was written in the 80s and here's a computery font, or, or whatever <laughs> you would do. Um, but at the same, mm, I'm not just going to talk about my feelings about the book, I'm going to ask about <laughs> how you tried to evoke a mood through design? Yeah, that's a good question. And I don't know if I can totally answer that because it was a lot of conversations and minds that went into that. But I think one of the big um, goals that we had was to kind of create like a, a queer timeline that goes like very far back into the past and very far into the future. So we didn't want to like date it to a particular moment in time like you mentioned. Um, on the back, we have this beautiful illustration by Mars Hobrecker. Is that how he pronounce his last name? Great. Um, which is like a very contemporary tattoo artist who's super brilliant and does great work. And we, um, and we put a marble butt on the front cover, you know, <laughs> which is like kind of the original, uh, one of the original queer gazes. <laughs> so we wanted to just um, show that this is just kind of a, a part of like the human experience that's always been there in some way or another and this is just like one stop in that progression um, yeah and we we took a lot of design cues from butt magazine hence the the pink and the big impact font <laughs> that was a big cue for us on the cover um, oh, go on. Oh, I just I want to add on to what Joel just said about the idea of sort of reaching back and reaching forward to ask Lauren a question um, Lauren, among many other things that they did to make this book exist in the way it does, also did a whole bunch of research for the glossary at the back of the book, um, which we talked about as a way to include some of the things that would not fit in a reasonable page constraint, but point to other directions, um, where the type of person who wants more, 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 and is obsessed with the story and the, the history can go look, and I was wondering if you could talk about some of that and some of your like most interesting places that took you. Oh, goodness. Um, I, think, I think the history of gay bars and just any kind of bar is basically, is the most interesting thing in the world, <laughs> pretty, pretty much. Right but person. some of those stories are really, really, really fantastic. Um, but yeah, I think, I think in general, it was a really exciting experience for myself doing the glossary because, um, you know, it, it felt, I think when, when we were working on the book, part of figuring out the arc was feeling like what stories have been told, what stories are accessible because we want to get the stories that are least accessible currently available. And so some of the political social story had been told more in, in various, um, you know, various formats, but it felt like a real, um, it felt really painful. Yeah, we didn't want to remove Lou from his context, his history, and also going with the sort of past and future idea. It was a context that he was being shaped by and was actively shaping. And as I just, I think the starting to research the glossary just came about of, um, you know, oh, there were, like, I think Ellis actually did a lot of the work of just kind of getting some of the initial, um, figuring out the who's, what, when's, where, why's, but we were like, oh, I think we could make this a little juicier, a yeah. little meatier. And then when we started looking into it, it just, everything connected, um, which of course it does. And yet the experience of finding that was such, such a beautiful sort of labyrinth of wandering, wandering through all of these 
gay signifiers and, um, oh, I mean, just the, the, the velvet whip. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it could go on and on. But, and I sort of had this vision that it was like building this little city in the back of the book um, that was this landscape. I love that. Um, yeah. You know, that, that, yeah, that would be kind of a reminder that lose joy and lose suffering were, were, were placed and they're placed within us and you know we also interact with all of our context so yeah I mean for me it kind of wound up being a metaphor for that but it was also just super fun to do <laughs> so um, yeah it that's the remarkable thing you do not need to go far to experience Lou Sullivan San Francisco it's not very far away the after party for this event is going to be like on the site of a bar that he used to frequent in the financial district. Um, I've been told I can ask one more question and I'm going to ask a tiny question. I would like to ask about the custom ampersand that was designed for this book. Um, talk to me about why there's a custom ampersand other than that it's totally awesome and looks great. Um, yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, that's working. Um, the custom ampersand was definitely a a request from the editors. Um, <laughs> what of many irrational requests? That most of which made it in the book. I don't think all of them, but yeah, most you, of them. You really did. So did that. But the yeah, there's the, there's a custom ampersand. It's it's just meant to mirror um, the 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 ampersand, the like idiosyncratic hand gesture that Lou would use in his diaries from I think like age like what 15 onward yeah. something like that um, and it was the the challenge was to like find a way to uh, transpose that like hand gesture into something that would read as type um, and then to make a font out of that <laughs> which um, was kind of a total nightmare <laughs> but um, and did I, it. I, yeah. I <laughs> But it was like a very cool learning experience. I, I tried like a bunch of, I watched so many YouTube videos <laughs> <laughs> to figure this out because I know really almost nothing about type design. Um, so it was, it was a thing that I had to figure out just for this one purpose and maybe someday in the future I'll need, all that knowledge will <laughs> become rel relevant again. But I think it, it, it was worth doing because I think it, it really, it kind of connects with like just his voice, you know, like, his his weird abbreviated words and you know his like Bob Dylan kind of dialect that he chooses to use and then kind of shifts over time you know <laughs> we just wanted to have as much of his personality um, sh like shine through and I think that's also one of the reasons that we decided to nix like the the dates mm -hmm. is just to like have it be not so much of like a like a a doc, like an artifact, but just an experience, like just as little, as little barrier between like the reader and Lou is what we were after. And so that's why we made all those crazy decisions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, we've got to wrap up. Um, I just like to end with a very quick plug. Um, come to the GLBT Historical Society and visit Lou. Any rando can do it on Thursdays and members can do it on Wednesdays and Fridays. Um, have an immediate experience with queer history. There's literally nothing stopping you. Um, that's all. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Take a newsletter. Take a, go take some things. And the book is upstairs. Thank you. Thank you, Lucasa, for programming this. And thank you, Berkeley Art Museum. <laughs>